Well, hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Mark Morningstar, and welcome to Scoliosis World. I know it's actually been a few months since we did our last episode, and we're finally able to get back into the swing of things here. And uh, I'm excited to be back. Uh, I really like doing these podcasts. And uh, we have, for the rest of the year here, we have a lot of, a lot of various topics uh, directly and indirectly connected to scoliosis. So uh, we're going to start a branch out. Uh, this year we got a lot of new things coming out uh, in the pipeline. Uh, I'll kind of go through with you on. But uh, today what I really want to talk about is the idea of risk-based scoliosis treatment. And what I mean by that is, you know, historically scoliosis treatment is sort of based on the curve measurement or the Cobb angle measurement, right? So, you know, curves of 10 to 20, 25 degrees, depending on, you know, the surgeon, depending on the uh, geographic region, uh, usually those are kind of watch and wait. In other words, do nothing. You know, you get to 20 or 25 degrees up to about 45, 50 degrees. And now you're talking, let's do bracing, you know, full-time bracing. Or in some parts of the world, now we get into the, you know, bracing plus exercises, you know, Shro therapy, Scully Smart Boot Camp, things like that. And of course, at 45 degrees or 50 degrees and up, uh, you're now talking about surgical threshold. But the reality is the curve measurement doesn't really necessarily, or, or in my opinion, shouldn't be the sole decision-making determinant. You know, for example, even just from a pain perspective, it's well known that the curve measurement in no way is correlated to the level of pain. I mean, I've even myself here in my own office, I've had patients who have curves of, you know, 25 degrees and their curve is practically debilitating to them. And yet I have other patients who have curves at 65 degrees who barely even knew they had a curve until they accidentally discovered it uh, by some chest x-ray or something else. So you know, the correlation of the curve measurement to pain and, and quality of life and things really isn't there consistently enough. And of course, that sort of speaks to some of the underlying aspects of scoliosis a lot. You know, it doesn't take but a cursory PubMed search to find, you know, melatonin problems, serotonin problems, um, progesterone problems, estradiol issues, uh, vitamin D deficiency, selenium deficiency, manganese deficiency, on and on and on and on, growth hormone differences, bone density differences, bone turnover differences. So there are so many other things that are sort of associated with scoliosis in some way that a lot of those things can also contribute to quality of life issues, to pain issues, et cetera. It's not just the curve measurement. Therefore, why do we do anything based on just a curve measurement? So what I sort of propose and what we've been, you know, at Scully Smart anyway, we've been proposing for a while is to try to treat patients based on a, a certain risk assessment. You know, for example, if you have a child who's diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic scoliosis, where they're, you know, less than 10 years old and they, you know, already have a, a 20 degree curve or higher, I would obviously treat them far more aggressively than if I, say, had a 14 year old that walked in with a 20 degree curve. They're both 20 degree curves, but the difference is the younger child has a lot of growth still ahead of them, uh, him or her. So obviously I would want to be a lot more aggressive in trying to make sure that that curve stays 20 degrees throughout their main growth spurt. But we can also assess risk, assess risk in other ways. You know, for example, one of the things that we do, or a couple of things that we do that I chiefly want to hit on is the idea that you can do a risk assessment based on genetic testing or neurotransmitter testing. You know, for example, there are certain neurotransmitter patterns that make it more likely that a child's curve will progress, therefore necessitating more aggressive intervention. So let's say, for example, a child comes in with a curve, and maybe that curve is only, say, 18 degrees but yet they have certain neurotransmitter values that are very uh, sort of telling. As an example, maybe they have a very, very low serotonin level. Well, that serotonin level might be predictive of as to whether or not that 18 degree curve is going to become a 28 or a 38 or a 48 degree curve in a relatively short period of time if we don't do something about it, meaning 
not just trying to stabilize the curve, but also to try to address that low or very low serotonin level. And I just pick on serotonin, but that's, you know, that's the easy one. But the reality is there are a, a number of certain neurotransmitter ratios that we look at that can help sort of predict whether or not a smaller curve becomes a bigger curve. And then that way, the management strategy becomes far more robust. You know, what we see on that x-ray that we all call scoliosis is really not the entire condition. And of course, those of you who are familiar with me, who have listened to me before, maybe, you know, you see me as a patient, you'll understand that I harp on this all the time. What we see on that x-ray is not the entire condition. It is only the predominant musculoskeletal end stage symptom of an entire cascade of things that are also going wrong in scoliosis. If you don't treat the entire person or you don't treat the, the entire condition for what it is, the chances of success in treating that end-stage musculoskeletal symptom that we see on the x-ray is going to be less. So as a provider, I prefer to hedge my bets that I'm doing everything possible to make sure that the, whatever physical results we get on the curvature and, and impact on curvature improvement, curvature stabilization, whatever the goal is, I want to make sure that there's nothing underneath that x-ray that might sabotage the ability of my physical treatment to provide a lasting outcome. So part of devising what that outcome should look like is to take that patient wherever they're at baseline in terms of their risk assessment. So like I mentioned, juvenile onset, higher risk. If I have a, a young girl who is still prepubescent, riser zero, ton of growth left, already 20 degree curve, that by itself puts that child at a higher risk compared to somebody who comes in with the same 20 degree curve and maybe even the same age, but they're now a riser three instead. So of course the risk is different. But the risk doesn't come just from age. It doesn't just come from their riser score. It doesn't just come from what their current curve measurement is, which all of those things you can actually use to calculate what's called a progression factor, which has been known since the early 2000s and published in, in, scoliosis, in the journal Scoliosis and the Spinal Disorders. But that's not, that, those are biomechanical prediction factors. What I'm talking about also, in addition to that, are biochemical or genomic or genetic. I, I want to assess all of those risks. It wasn't too long ago there was a test called a Scully score. It's sort of fallen out of favor, but it, it was the first attempt to use genetics to predict the chance that a curve would reach a surgery threshold. Well, even though that, that test itself did not, produce, did not prove to be reliable enough across the spectrum of different ethnicities and so on, there is still merit in that concept. And the reality is at this point is there are genomic variations or genomic variants, excuse me, that are associated with scoliosis. And those are things that can be tested for from person to person to determine if they have any significant genetic risk factors that might impact their curve during growth. Like I mentioned already also with neurotransmitters, if a serotonin value or a norepinephrine value or a histamine value hit certain numbers or hit certain minimum thresholds, not just in and of their own or, or with respect to their own normal range, but also in ratio to one another, those are red flags for me to say, okay, this person's curve is ripe for progression. If we don't do something about this neurotransmitter ratio or about this genomic pattern. And in fact, back in uh, 2000, I believe it was 2014, uh, was the first study that uh, I published on neurotransmitter ratios and what kind of an impact they have on the outcomes of physical treatment. And when children who participate in a physical treatment or participated in boot camp, Scully Smart Boot Camp, if they didn't take the extra steps to work on their neurotransmitter ratios, assuming they were abnormal, of course, if they didn't take steps to remedy those, their ability to retain their changes that they got during boot camp were less likely than if they had taken that extra step and worked on the problem in its entirety. Now, the nice thing is most of the stuff is really based on different integrative or more accurately functional medicine principles. 
where the idea is I'm not really trying to label somebody with a different disease or something like that. What we're really trying to do is to identify from person to person where is that person's physiology going haywire. And depending on what's going haywire, how best can we intervene in a very minimalistic sense to restore normal physiology and hence everything else downstream takes care of itself. Well, that's the sort of thing that can happen for just, as, again, I always pick on serotonin, it seems like, but take the case of low serotonin. Well, I could have low serotonin because I don't have enough of the precursor, you know, amino acid, 5-HTP. 5-HTP converts directly into serotonin. Well, this person who has low serotonin might need 5-HTP. This person over here who has serotonin, maybe they need vitamin B6 or vitamin B12 to help improve their conversion. Or maybe they need... Uh, BH4, tetrahydrobiopterin, if you want to know the long form. Maybe they're deficient in that molecule. Their body's not recycling BH4 enough to make enough serotonin. So, I mean, those are three entirely different reasons and, in effect, three entirely different interventions, all with the goal of improving serotonin. And I could take, I could line up 10 patients who all have low serotonin, and they will need any or all three of those various interventions in order to fix or improve their serotonin. So it becomes more, and really where a lot of the, uh, the terminology is going now is a lot of places will call it personalized medicine or precision medicine, where you're really taking genomics, you're taking individual values to create a treatment strategy that is very highly specific to that patient. You know, classically in scoliosis, we think that you know, an individualized treatment plan is one that's sort of custom to that person's curve pattern, which is a good starting point for sure. But there are a lot of people with the same curve pattern that also don't respond to the same physical treatments. I mean, the reality is you can find case reports from all over the world and, and case studies and perspective trials and retrospective series all over on all sorts of different exercise therapies and all kinds of bracing and types of braces, European or American, what have you. And guess what? They all work for certain individuals. So it's not really a question in, in this day and age, in my opinion, as to whether or not a physical treatment works. It's about the provider and about figuring out for the, for the single individual patient in front of them which physical treatment, which metabolic treatment, which genomic treatment, which functional medicine treatment or treatments are best going to work for that one individual in front of you. And in fact, you know, somebody I know, John Taylor, who's at Spinal Technology, made the comment to me the other day. He says, you know, in my opinion, the best brace is the one that works for that child. And frankly, I agree with 100% with that. Uh, because you will find this study over here says that this brace is better than this brace. That study over here says the exact opposite. This study over here says this brace is better. Well, the reality is it's not really the brace at this point. It's not really the physical treatment at all. It's the patient selection. And that's what really matters. I think we're moving into an age of scoliosis treatment where, you know, providers shouldn't be known by the treatments that they provide. So this is a, a spine core provider, or I, I use a scoli brace, or I use XYZ, or I do scoli smart boot camp. That really is sort of becoming outdated. Really, the idea is to take the patient in front of you, assess their risk, genomically, metabolically, biomechanically, all of those, to determine that patient's risk assessment. From that risk assessment, then, we can now create an entirely customized treatment plan for that individual to try to obtain the best result for that individual. Because at the end of the day, for that individual or for that child's mom and dad, Guess what? They don't care what all the other research out there says. They want to see a benefit for their child. And I completely understand that. So I think providers need to move into an era where providers are known by the fact that they are good at getting consistent outcomes rather than focusing on what they're using to obtain those outcomes. Because frankly, at the end of the day, I don't care if you wave magic crystals over a child. Guess what? If you can cut their curve in half and prevent them from needing surgery, I don't think mom and dad are going to care less what you used. But the fact is you spared their child from a surgery. You spared their child from a life-altering treatment or you spared their child from a lifetime potentially of chronic pain or other organic health issues if their curve gets severe enough. So 
The physical treatments don't matter. It's about taking that person, taking all of the information about that person, basically putting that into a pot, stirring it up and saying, hey, hey, look, this is a treatment plan we're going to use for you because this is what I think will work best for you. And I, as a provider, have access to all of these various tools, and I'm not afraid to use any one of them. Sort of like, you know what, a hammer is a great tool. It's a fantastic tool until I've tried to pound a screw into a piece of wood. Now the hammer's not such a great tool, right? So, and it's not that the hammer is a bad tool. You have to have a lot of tools because not every patient is a nail. Some patients are screws. Some patients are staples. Some patients are thumbtacks, right? So you have to treat each patient as an individual. Having an entire tool bag at your disposal, both from biomechanical treatments to um, exercise-based treatments, bracing treatments, not being afraid to send somebody for VBT or Apifix or some of the other newer surgical techniques. You know, there are so many things at our disposal that we should be focused on trying to get the best individual outcome for each individual patient in front of us. And that's where risk-based treatment really comes into play. So I encourage you as patients out there or parents considering taking their child in for care, doesn't matter if it's to me, doesn't matter who it's for, go with a provider who's going to use everything they can to determine your child's best course of therapy. Or if you're an adult patient with scoliosis, chances are to this point in time, all you've ever done is physical treatment. It's probably worth it to have somebody look at your hormones, look at your neurotransmitters, look at your genetic risk. Yes, you're an adult and you're done growing, but that doesn't matter. You still have all of those under the other underlying things that we know happen in idiopathic scoliosis that, quite frankly, have probably not been treated up until this point. So I think you owe it to yourself to have those other things checked out to see if there's something else you could be doing to complement what you might be doing physically for your scoliosis to help that physical treatment, whatever it looks like, to get a better outcome. You know, even in, even in cases like where people do side planks, you know, that's a very popular uh, exercise for scoliosis. But guess what? Not everybody just does side planks. Some people do half moon poses with it. Some people do Botox injections with it into the some of the paraspinal musculature with it. They don't necessarily just do side planks. So it's not as simple as just saying, I'm going to do this exercise. You have to take the person in front of you, assess what you think as the provider who has seen presumably many, many scoliosis patients, and say, based on your curve pattern, based on your height, based on your risk and all facets of risk, these are the things that I think are going to best serve you individually. So that's really kind of the, the message I want to you know, drive home today on this podcast is risk-based scoliosis treatment really to me is the future. And it's got to start with that. So that way, whatever strategy you're employing as the provider and as the family going forward, everybody's on the same page and everybody knows that they're going into it eyes wide open with the most robust, comprehensive strategy available. So chew on that. Think about that. Uh, if you have any questions, you are welcome to reach out to me personally drmorningstar at scoliosmart.com. Of course, this is Scoliosis World for this week. I would also like to thank our sponsor for this podcast, which is Back Genius. Uh, they are actually the, uh, the founding uh, physician vendor company for uh, the Scoliosmart activity suit, as, as well as a lot of the other uh, metabolic, genomic, and uh, hormonal testing uh, that can be done through Back Genius. Uh, and their own uh, their line of supplements that are sold through physician offices exclusively. So thank you to Back Genius. And uh, as for me, I'm Dr. Mark Morningstar, obviously. This is Scoliosis World. We'll see you next week.